you very much. It's a rare privilege to be here with you, <laughs> and uh, especially after we've had a wonderful session uh, dealing with uh, open science and the idea uh, of advancing uh, uh, an open science platform for Africa. Now, uh, I will move very quickly through many images. So, uh, as we will say, so uh, uh, fasten your seatbelt and get ready <laughs> for quite a ride. Uh, here's what I will cover. Uh, brief prologue and talking about our changing world and about global knowledge of global science. And then five enormous transformations. And then talk about African realities and uh, why we need an open science platform and seven strands that we need to work on. And then I would like to end with something very important, which is about the values of science. So uh, every time that uh, you will uh, see a red slide like this one, uh, it means that I'm starting one of those topics. But it also means I'm getting closer to the end. So, get the end and move on. so open science has been now very much on the tip of the tongue of many people around the world. And it's uh, correct for us to ask, what is it? And it is a movement. In fact, uh, Mr. Chairman, we talked about uh, whether it was a platform or a movement we were creating. We are part of a global movement, and we are creating that movement in Africa. But the idea is to make scientific research, data, and dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society, a society that's interested to know more. And this is made possible, of course, because of the digital revolution. So what is the open science framework? Well, we get software for the scientists, free and open sources, public-private workflows, seamless integrations, and the like. And the participants can manage their own individual projects provided that they participate within this framework. Archive data, quickly share files, controlled access and collaboration, supercharge the workflow. So uh, as we go along, it's important to know uh, that we have now a vision for an African Open Science Platform, AOSP, and uh, this is the cover of our current little brochure on that topic. Now, the world is changing rapidly, and this is just one of its manifestations. It changed rapidly because of the internet. The internet was created largely by these two guys, who happened to be friends, uh, Windsurf and uh, uh, Bob Kahn, invented the TCP IP, which is still the backbone of the internet system. Tim Berners-Lee invented the WWW, the World Wide Web, and uh, HTML language. And between them, those three guys have changed the world more profoundly than any political or military leader uh, could have ever imagined. It, uh, there's no country that is immune. Uh, we are communicating with the speed mm -hmm. of light. And knowledge has become global. What happens in Brazil is known simultaneously in South Africa, in uh, the Netherlands, in uh, Russia, in China, everywhere. And as a librarian, I'm very happy that now we have the technology to put at the fingertips of everybody the entire uh, record of humanity. So we live in a world of global interactions. And it's the age of information. It's the age of connectivity, especially since the marriage of the mobile phone and the internet. But when we talk about information and knowledge, it's not enough. Data, when organized, becomes information. Information, when explained, becomes knowledge. But what we really need is wisdom. Wisdom is a different quality than knowledge. As I say frequently, those who invaded Iraq had a lot of knowledge. They knew how to fire rockets, how to run planes, etc. But one can question the wisdom of the decisions that they made, given the consequences that happened. But the digital future is unstoppable, and the ICT revolution is continuing. And global knowledge and global science have now been born and are fight, firing away in steroids now. Science is practiced collaboratively and globally. And this comes only through dialogue <coughs> and collaboration everywhere in the world. So let's look at the world. How do they work? 
this diagram shows the collaborations between various countries who are at the outer side of the circle in different colors, working with scientists in other countries. It's a global community. It is no longer separate countries. Even if you look within countries, they work a lot. So United States, for example, which is a vast continent, does a lot of work between American scientists, less so among the other leaders. So who is leading? Well, we can look at this, and we can see that with the exception of China, it's all the Western powers. There's uh, China, followed by Germany, and the uh, UK, and Japan, and uh, then the rest of the other Europeans. And these are individual uh, <coughs> institutions that make major contributions by themselves. If you look at the <coughs> output, well, it turns out in the first 25 in research papers, or patents, or expenditure, or higher education, there is no African country except one, South Africa, which appears only <coughs> as number 23 in the expenditure column, one of the gray ones that you see there. There's no other African country. In fact, if you map the size and the number of scientists per population against the expenditure, again, in this diagram, only South Africa appears at the bottom right-hand corner. And uh, everybody else from the African continent is missing. So African societies are not among the global leaders in the advancement of science today. And only South Africa is the one that appears in these diagrams. So we need to develop our capabilities and to integrate the global tapestry of science. And what is that global tapestry of science? In one word, revolution. It's a revolutionary time. Everything is being transformed. And I'll show you examples of that. Now first, we have five enormous transformations that are taking place. And I'll talk about each of them briefly. The new knowledge revolution, big data and internet explosion, social connectivity, evolutionary programming, artificial intelligence. Now, the new knowledge revolution is very strange. It is. It has seven <coughs> pillars, as I see it. And that is, the first one is about parsing life and organization. What do I mean by that? Throughout <coughs> history, whether you're looking at individual monographs, individual essays, individual articles, or individual books, knowledge was packaged and provided in bits and pieces that we could call almost like bricks. And the, the structure of knowledge was built out of those individual bricks. And uh, it was the unit of the transfer of knowledge across space and time. <laughs> but we have the right to question whether it's <coughs> dead or alive. Dead or alive in what sense? If you have a book and I have the same edition of that book, and you open page 153, uh, the first line in your book will be the same as the first line in my book. Close it. Ten years later, we can open it. It will still be the same. On the other hand, now we have websites. And if I tell you, look up this material in that website, within two hours, the website may have been changed. It's a living, constantly updated uh, document. It is not a fixed document. And the web pages are the new parsing where it used to be the books or the essays and so on. And not only are we at Web 2.0 where we both contribute post as well as lead other people, we're working on the semantic web, which is going to allow us to look for ideas and connections behind the objects, not just the objects themselves. We already are dealing with augmented reality as a matter of course. Uh, who hasn't looked at the map and a uh, photograph from a, a satellite and then seen some major streets name written on it? Well, it wasn't in the photograph, it was added later, it's augmented reality. Uh, as a result of all of that, what we have is really the equivalent of a vibrant, changing, interconnected knowledge base that's the size of the whole planet. It's like a huge brain with neurons firing everywhere in Brazil, and in uh, Russia, in South Africa, in China, in Malaysia, etc. Second major transformation is image and text. For a long time, text was the primary means of communication now we increasingly rely on image. Now, if you look at an image like that, 
it's much easier to look at the description of these uh, cones uh, uh, rather than read them and imagine what they could look like. The reason we didn't use many images was very expensive. But now it's become very easy. Everybody, even in their cameras, uh, in their telephones, are using images and sending them out. The third major pillar of that transformation is the relationship between humans and machines. And with the exception of pure math and some questions in philosophy, type of questions like uh, uh, what's the, the meaning of uh, uh, the universe, what's the purpose of life, and so on, every other field of knowledge can only be done through machines. Humans need machines to access, retrieve, manipulate, and add to the body of, body of knowledge. And that, in a sense, expands our brain's reach beyond anything our parents could have imagined. Complexity and chaos are a new phenomenon. We have now recognized that Newtonian equations are not enough to explain the world, and the emerging science of complexity and chaos is with us. That's a whole different topic for another lecture. But Actually, I believe computation and research, and this is very relevant to what we're discussing today, uh, have acquired a different meaning. Uh, science used to organize data in collections, and now we are looking at not just the collections of data, into the connections between the collections. And that places a different level of difficulty. And what it does is that the computational function which used to be looked at as well, you know, on a computer, you have some calculation, you give this dumb machine, it keeps running and running, you'll do the calculations, but it's not really helping in the research. Well, all that has changed. Uh, our ability to cross in different data collections, in different streams, in different disciplines, is being manipulated and helped by computational science. And computational scientists have now come into the forefront from where they were just a backroom support to scientists working in various disciplines. And then we have the greatest thing, which is convergence and transformation. Transformation meaning that sciences that used to be done one way, thanks to new technologies, are being done in different ways. But convergence, well, the simplest one would be to say, think of, uh, of uh, chemistry and think of biology, and then you have biochemistry. Well, it was came out of a convergence of different fields. So you look at this, and we're looking at a transformative research, and right now, the most important transformation is bio-info nanotechnologies, which summarized into bint, which in Arabic means girl. <laughs> 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 but uh, these are converging sciences. So uh, we know, for example, we've been storing information in flash sticks, uh, before that we started the hard drive, etc., etc. But can you imagine the efficiency of DNA? I mean, you can't even see a single cell without a microscope. And within the cell you have a, a nucleus, and within the nucleus you have chromosomes, and within the chromosomes you have the DNA. And that stores, that stores three billion base pairs, about a billion books. And uh, if you could stretch it out, it'll be about two meters, the, the uh, DNA molecule. And if you put all the molecules of my body next to each other, they would go back and forth to the moon 8,000 times. It would be the equivalent of half the diameter of the solar system from one human being. Mm. So what can we store information in DNA? Well, let's look at that. This is a very famous uh, uh, set of pictures that were made by Edward Muybridge in 1886 for Leland Stanford, who was a very rich railroad magnate, founder, uh, governor of California, founder of Stanford University. And uh, he asked him to prove whether or not a horse that is running actually has a moment when the feet don't touch. So it's a very famous set of photographs because it was before movies, but actually the answer is yes. Uh, here's the picture. These were very fast pictures, top of science and technology in 1886. Now, because it's very famous, this was taken as a test by scientists to see if we could map and store information into DNA. So what you do is you basically convert it into digital information, and then you map the digital information into the DNA code with, uh, with the 
letters, and then you insert it into a bacterium, and then after three generations, you, you see whether you can retrieve the information again from the bacterium. As a matter of fact, you can. This is the actual, how it reappeared after three generations in the bacterium. Uh, this is just one example out of many, many examples of how uh, bio and info and nanotechnologies are converging in many different things. But if we could succeed, there's still a lot of problems with that. If we could succeed to do that, if we could succeed to do that, then the entire information available in the world could be stored in less than one kilogram. One kilogram of DNA. And then beyond that, of course, is the fact that to handle all our uh, realities, we need uh, pluridisciplinarity for policy formulation. Pluridisciplinarity is because there is interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. But I don't want to get into the differences between these different kinds of, of collaborative uh, operations. But fundamentally, it is there. And it's impacting almost all disciplines. There is no longer the, the cleanliness that we used to know in our departments in universities, where the Department of Chemistry, Department of Physics, Department of this, uh, or the structure that people used to classify natural, human, applied fields, humanities, etc. Uh, this is a more recent map done by the New York Times. As you can see, it is very, very different from the classical definitions that existed. <coughs> and we can actually look at the way these definitions work through the interconnectedness uh, that we can map on the web. And this is, for example, the social sciences, and these are the natural sciences. The density of the, the, the cross-referencing is available, as you can see there, and the size of the circles is the self-referencing of each of these disciplines. Now, along with that, we have what we call the big data phenomenon and the internet explosion. Didn't uh, surf one of the two fathers of the internet, and myself and others serve on committees where we were looking about the future of the internet, and specifically about big data. Well, how much is big data? In 2007, that's barely 10 years ago, 2007, University of Southern California estimated the entire available information on the planet from the time of the cave paintings down to the latest information was 256 exabytes. And we are now putting two exabytes per day on the internet. Now, you may ask, what's an exabyte? Well, I could say a billion, billion bytes, but that wouldn't help you. So think <laughs> that if all the text in the Library of Congress was digitized, all the text in the Library of Congress was digitized, one exabyte would be 100,000 times bigger than all the text at the Library of Congress. And we are putting two of those a day on the internet, probably more by now. So big data is here. And what we know of it, what is dealing with it, is a very, very small part. And the age of big data is already here. It raises questions of privacy, of cybersecurity, and a lot more change is going to come. And where are we going to be? I don't know. But with somebody asks me, many people ask me, because I serve on these committees, and I say, a little humility. Didn't Bob Khan and these people didn't imagine what the internet was going to do to the whole world in the 30 years. And now with the speed of change going on, how would I be able to predict what the state of the world will be like in 25 or 30 years? I mean, you got a little bit of humility. I remember back in the early 90s when I started using email, you know, I thought, oh, wow, email. That's really terrific, you know, we won't have to wait and so on, but things have changed. But how far will they change? Well, global IP traffic will increase threefold in the next five years, and smartphones will account for the bulk of the traffic, 30% in 2020, from up from 8%. And that's given this huge expansion. In other words, smartphones are expanding at almost 60% per annum. So the compound interest uh, application is just enormous. <coughs> And mobile data will grow at 53% per annum between 15 and 20%. So 
So it will grow eightfold between now and 2020. And all devices will be interconnected. And uh, that, of course, is part of the background to my enormous transformation number three, which is social connectivity. Well, that came from the marriage of the internet and the mobile phone. It has changed everything. We have a hyper-connected generation. And you are parts of it, but you are <laughs> the older part. I look at my granddaughter, and I see the future. So what do they do? Well, first of all, uh, they're into texting. <coughs> Not talking to each other, texting. <laughs> and uh, this is the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. That's the famous painting by Rembrandt. And here's the school outing. Driving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Girlfriend, boyfriend. Oh, <laughs> watching a game. They at the beach. Going out to the restaurant. <laughs> in another museum. On trains and buses everywhere. Texting, reading, texting, sharing. And uh, everybody seems to be connected 24-7. But for some of us from another generation, it's <coughs> difficult to get heard. <laughs> Those of us who are not texting and who are yelling, I'm being heard. So we have something to do. Now I'm a librarian, as you know, so what would happen? my beloved books. Well, they will have a place, I think. But where this is closer to what my uh, uh, childhood looked like, uh, this is the way it looks nice now. And people are reading sometimes on tablets or on, on that, but increasingly they read even on their phone. But I believe, yes, but there's a lot more to come because the new ICT revolution is on its way. Big data, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence. A lot more to come. Evolutionary programming was developed in Stanford by John Cordell and others. Fundamentally, it says we'll do a test and then we'll allow the computer to do random changes and pick up the better. If it improves, then we'll save it. If it doesn't improve, we will discard it. But it's uh, uh, with the chaotic system, the mathematics became more and more difficult. So for example, the classic problem of chaotic uh, uh, systems is the uh, double uh, uh, pendulum problem, and nobody was able to solve that for decades. And uh, now look at this equation, and what's interesting about it is that it was defined by a machine, not by a human being. Mm -hmm. Through various random testing and millions and millions of uh, iterations, machines are now helping with solving technical problems, not just with applying the, the information to something. So they were able to fit that equation to this curve. Uh, it's a very difficult curve. Even with Fourier transforms, it would be very difficult to do. So we now move to artificial intelligence. Now artificial intelligence, you know, has many different kinds of applications from facial recognition to uh, playing chess to everything else. And uh, what is happening now is that out of our machines, our software emerges a new intelligence and uh, it's impacting everything. In fact, the McKinsey Global Institute estimated that uh, AI is contributing to a transformation of society that is happening 10 times faster and 300 times the scale of the Industrial Revolution. In other words, it's 3,000 times the disruptive effect of the Industrial Revolution. Remember that Deep Blue defeated Gary Kasparov at chess? Hey guys, that was over 20 years ago. Well, it's already over 20 years ago. And that's, of course, when you give a, a computer a, a well-confined set of rules and say, play within these rules. But there are other things. Uh, in 2011, uh, IBM's Watson program <coughs> defeated the best humans at the game called Jeopardy, which people think represents more of general intelligence. Watson <laughs> was put to work. And Watson was put in a, uh, a cancer institute in New York in 2013, and later on we went and asked the nurses how they liked working with Watson. And 90% of them <coughs> said, we do whatever Watson says. <laughs> and I, we asked why, and they said, because he is always right. That's an interesting observation here. Notice 
how the word king slipped in. <laughs> There's an anthropomorphism that happened. The computer is almost a human being. Huh? So some of that. And they're being very useful. Uh, this is uh, precision agriculture with drones and robots, uh, landing planes when there's a fog going on. They can do microsurgery. Uh, they can play music, play a violin. They can play the trumpet. They can do all sorts of other things. People ask, will they replace us? Well, given the cost of robotics and the cost of labor, the answer is yes. <laughs> How much will they replace us? Well, actually, it will take 28% of the current jobs, but it will create 35% new jobs. The problem is that the people who are holding these 28% jobs are not easily trainable to take the 35 new jobs. Mm. So Mr. Trump's uh, unemployed miners of coal in uh, West uh, Virginia are not easily going to take jobs uh, in Silicon Valley uh, <laughs> on the new uh, work going on. So we're trying to make ways in which they can work together, including on the same assembly line. This is a robot called Baxter. Uh, these are other things so that humans and robots work together, just as humans work with machines. And some said, well, we need to make them look more like us. That's Professor Ishiguro in Kyoto. And uh, he's creating a robot that looks just like him. He calls them humanoids, exactly like them. And this uh, pretty girl that's winking at you, she's a robot that was made in Hong Kong last year, 2017. And uh, so we're having transformations in appearance and everything else. What next, who knows? But we do know that things are moving and moving very fast in new ways. And the digital revolution, which has swept everything in this new digital universe, where change is happening with incredible speed, uh, where we will have driverless cars very soon and other things of that nature, there are new paradigms through artificial intelligence to handle ever more complex realities and ever larger amounts of big data. So that revolution has had profound implications, not just for society, but for science, how we do science. Now, all states must adapt or risk becoming the back order, and that's why open science is a vital enabler for countries to minimize the risks and leapfrog it helps maintaining the rigor and reliability of science, allows creatively integrating diverse data resources, it promotes open innovation, it facilitates engaging with other societies and others in society, and therefore we believe that it will also be fundamental to the realization of the uh, sustainable development goals of the world. So why isn't it already happening? Well, part of the problem is that there are important obstacles in making good use of data because disciplinary fields have different ways of organizing their data and connecting them is not easy. And even where data is easily available, the integration of this diverse data can generally only be achieved within a single or closely allied fields. Now, that's where we are in the world. How about Africa? Well, I regret to say that the reality of Africa has to be looked at very, very carefully. First of all, it's huge. You can actually put China, United States, Alaska, and Europe in Africa and still have leftover space. Oh. And it is uh, splintered into 54, maybe 56, depending on how you count them, uh, countries. Uh, well, we don't know, but <laughs> some of them are very small. But it shares a common ecology. That ecology uh, tends to have extremes. It has the largest desert the world and uh, the greatest heat around that desert, and intensive rainfall. Intensive rainfall is in fact also becoming problematic because with climate change it becomes less predictable. So you have cycles of droughts and floods all the time. And the, the study of these phenomena, whether it is in terms of rainfall or on desertification, you can see the amount of desertification in the yellow and red on this map. Uh, makes that Africa really needs to tackle its environmental problems and its societal problems and its risk and resilience problems as Africa. All these little countries cannot tackle these issues and we need to merge that data, connect the scientists and get on with it. On top of that, Africa is the only high growth part of the world in terms of population. As you can see the blue line there going up, that's Africa, 
The green line is Asia and its tapering over the century. The others remain pretty much stable or going down. Uh, so this is the UN consensus projections for 2015, and they imagine that Africa will quadruple, quadruple 4.4 billion by the end of the century. My friends in IASA say, no, 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 that's too high. And I said to them, yes, or okay, your estimates are gonna be trebling, 3.3 billion. Okay, it's not 4.4, it's trebling of population in under a century, in one lifetime, in Africa with all these problems, that's huge, regardless of whether it's trebling or quadrupling. Especially when you add that all these other problems are there, deforestation, uh, desertification, etc., etc. We are uh, having the highest number of countries. And then this just came out and really, really disturbed me. In extreme poverty, Nigeria has now displaced India as the country with the largest number of extremely poor people, 87 million. In comparison with India, 73 million. That was two months ago. And the Brookings report did this, said 14 of the 18 countries in the world where the number of poor people in extreme poverty is increasing rather than decreasing, 14 of them are in Africa. So when we think of that, and we think of the poverty, and we think of the misery of these people, and the risk that they're in for everything from food security to something else, hey, this is not a luxury. What we are talking about is not a luxury. We need to do it. Uh, Africa on the whole make up about two thirds of the world's extreme poor today. And if famine trends continue by 2030, they will have 90% of the extreme poor of the world. So African science is relatively backward. I showed you these except for South Africa. Mm -hmm. And Africa is huge, fragmented, and the gap between those who have capacity and those who don't is large and growing. And therefore, we want to marry all the science capability mm -hmm. and create that open platform to enable us to challenge <coughs> oil nation. And we want to adapt in our own way as a leader and not a follower. So that's why we need the African Open Science Platform. Why? Both African scientists at the cutting edge of contemporary data intensive science as a fundamental resource for modern society. What will it do? Well, it's a federated hardware and communications infrastructure that will include policy and enabling practices, and it's a network of excellence in open science that supports scientists and other social actors throughout Africa. How will it be done? <coughs> Nobody does it alone. It is all about cooperation and networks, and we spent the last two days debating things, and uh, we have defined seven strands. My friend would say six strands and two, but I'm going to say seven strands. So seven strands, what are they? Well, first you have to create a portal for the movement and then you move on. So let's start them one by one. To create a portal, that means to register uh, for African and related international data collections and services, including a proposed governance structure. And then we have a network of computing facilities that will enable us to connect all parts of the continent and researchers both within an African cloud, if you want, and with the rest of the world. Then we have software tools and advice on research and data management, which has to be maintained. Now, software is defined as organized information in the form of operating systems, utilities, programs, and applications, and applications that enable computers to do the work required. So we need to get this information out. We need to get people to share. And that's the important part, get people to share, because collectively we will do a lot more than individually. We need to build a data science institute of excellence, a network that for capacity building, a network for open science access and dialogue. Data science will have mathematics and statistics, computer sciences, domains of business and knowledge, software development, traditional research, and machine learning. Machine learning is now a central part of developing artificial intelligence. I will go from data sources to data storage to big data analytics and M2M. You know what M2M stands for? Machine to machine. Because the world is now filled with machine to machine working with, to, with each other. Simplest example, if you drive your car through a toll booth and the toll booth reads the 
the signal that you have in the car. So machine to machine is going to be a big thing. But the production of new knowledge will require collaboration between the data institute and people in universities and elsewhere. And so the work on priority programs, we're going to test all these ideas by working together on priority programs, such as what? Well, infectious disease, disaster risk, resilient cities, agriculture, all of these are fundamental problems for Africa, fundamental to reach the sustainable development goals, fundamental to avoid the misery that's going to impact on a lot more of our brothers and sisters. And that's why we selected them to be the ones who are going to test our work on. And that will require recognizing the reality that South Africa, as I've pointed out, was the only one that was on the charts you saw, capacity building. We must have a system for capacity building, and that will require that our network of open science access and dialogue is reinforced. And uh, uh, you know that's how to share knowledge, how to make it accessible, how to make it transparent, how to develop collaborations around it. But we need an extra word on capacity building, because that remains uh, the Achilles heel of our current programs. Because the absence of capacity building means that as the world zooms along in terms of new technology, new innovations, new this and that, the gap between the haves and have-nots, between the rich and the poor, will increase. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not what we want. So we have a dynamic younger generation that is born in the era of the digital connectivity. So we must focus on building up our science and technology capabilities. It so happens that the scientists of the world got together in uh, about 10 years ago, and uh, a little more than 10 years ago. And uh, I was privileged to co-chair that team. And we sent that team uh, to present to Kofi Annan, who was then the Secretary General of the UN. Uh, uh, on his right, on the left, is myself and uh, uh, Professor Jacob Paris of Brazil, who were the co-leaders. And on the other side was the head of uh, UNDP and Rampela Rampela from South Africa, who was the managing director of the World Bank at that time. Mm -hmm. So we had the UNDP and the World Bank on one side, and we had the scientists on the other, and they were telling him, this is how we're going to build a better future. So what did we say? We said science and society, we have five clusters of recommendations. We need to recognize each one of these. Let's take them one at a time very quickly. In terms of science and society, there has to be a policy to promote science, but science <coughs> must participate in the formulation of policy. Mr. Trump keeps saying that climate change is a hoax. No, science says something else. This is an interesting historic event. This is the Washington Post on 9-11, the day of the famous attack of 9-11. But what was on the first page? On the two sides of the picture, broader stem cell research backed, the, the scientists backed the research against the view of uh, the president at the time, George W. Bush, and they recommended tighter rules for arson. This is how scientists participate in the formulation of policy, <laughs> and therefore the, the voice of science has a place. And the scientific community must work with the private sector, with the media, and the public at large. And uh, Jawaharlal Nehru had a beautiful statement. The future belongs to science and those who make friends with science. And now in the house of science, so I don't have to question that. Human resources, well, we need to improve human resources from kindergarten to postdoc. Well, uh, we have major problems. Look at this picture, love that picture, but look at this picture. There isn't even a chair for someone to sit on. There are places where there are no schools at all. Kids working with computers, kids learning by rote. Uh, we want to encourage them to ask. What if, what if? That's how we teach something. The content of curriculum has to change. We have to have self-confidence, free expression, etc., and a lot more. And we have to improve science and technology at all levels. And we have to have a special outreach to women and to minorities. And then we have to deal with the problem of brain gain and brain drain. There is a major problem. Africa has a huge diaspora of distinguished scientists all over the world. We need to relink them with the efforts we are doing here. We need institutions 
that can promote centers of excellence where the work will be actually done. The platform will link all of these people, but nevertheless, <laughs> we need what's happening on the ground. And we'll have virtual networks of excellence, regional networks, and building capacity by working together. And if we build capacity, then science will fulfill its promise. But not everybody can build by just collaboration. In fact, if you look at the uh, uh, left-hand side of that slide, the very lagging countries will require direct input, not just collaboration. Public-private domains, the private sector drives more than two-thirds of global research, and therefore we must find a boundary to understand how we can give copyright, intellectual property rights, and other things to work with the private sector and with the public goods. And this is a good example from Japan. Uh, this is a business academic government collaboration in what we call the clusters, uh, in development clusters. And uh, technological incubators, these will open new doors. And then finally, if you get the first four correctly, then you worry about money. People who throw money at the problem without getting the four items fixed, they will not get the results they want. So what do you do? Well, let me give you an example. For one thing, I would say trust young people. So funding research to funding companies, that becomes important. In America, they have venture capitalists who put pennies in order to hit the new Microsoft, the new uh, Amazon, the new <laughs> uh, Apple, and make billions out of that. And here's a nice picture. Um, the question behind that picture is here. This is Microsoft Corporation, 1978. Would you have invested when these kids came to you and said, hey, we have something called Windows. It's going to change the world. It's going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread. Come on, give us some money. And that's Bill Gates. That's, uh, uh, the kid. And I'm very happy to say that not only did he become one of the most successful uh, entrepreneurs in history, but also one of the most generous. Uh, this is the declaration we were at Davos together, and this is the declaration where he announced the creation of the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. that has done so much. So we need to do all of that. But also, and that's maybe the last thing I would say, we need to recognize uh, that science is not just about doing stuff. It's about a set of values. The practice of science requires adherence to a set of values, and scientists defend that with more rigor than any other community. These are what I call the values of science. Truth, honor, creativity, constructive subversiveness, tolerance, arbitration. Let's take the first one. There is zero tolerance on fabrication of data, alternative facts, fake news, post-truth world. None of that is acceptable to science. And scientists police themselves with a rigor that puts to shame political leaders and media outlets. Uh, think of one, soon you may remember that case in South Korea, they advanced that they had made major breakthroughs in, in uh, uh, biology. Uh, it turned out that it wasn't. People said, but you can't embarrass us. And the scientists of South Korea said, if we don't expose him, that is the real embarrassment to South Korea. Mm -hmm. And the Seoul National University investigative panel released its final report in 2006, and he had faked his data. Mm -hmm. And the groundbreaking studies were discarded, and he resigned from all his posts. Yeah. What other community enforces that kind of rigor? Truth? But no, you can make errors. I mean, I report my data and I say, I think it means that, I may be wrong, but that's okay. But to fabricate the data, yeah. that is what ostracized it from the world. Honor, honor, the second thing that scientists do, you cannot take somebody's work, plagiarize somebody's work and put your name on it. Mm -hmm. That is, the, the, I mean, the second crime. And regretfully, this is where plagiarism is in many countries. And therefore, to prevent plagiarism, we really have to emphasize this in schooling and education, because ultimately the values of science are forged by student practice and teacher example. But science also values creativity and imagination. It's not just a small work that is done. Uh, we think of people like Einstein. And he said, imagination is more important than knowledge. 
for knowledge is limited to all we know now and understand, while imagination embraces everything and all there ever will be to know and understand. It requires us to sometimes make leaps of the imagination. This is the famous Schrodinger's cat about quantum uh, state. And to imagine things that never were and still see how they are, there should be no limit to what may be explored, no fear to tread in unknown paths. Then constructive subversiveness. By that I mean that our respect and admiration for Newton is not diminished because Einstein transformed the world that Newton had created. We respect them both, we admire them both. And in fact, we expect the next advance will be a further destruction of the existing paradigm. If that didn't come, then we would have no more science. And these were all the great dissenters and the great innovators. And that requires something else. It requires tolerance of engagement with the unusual view. I mean, just think, 1905, an unknown person by the name of Albert Einstein, who did not have a PhD, did not work at a university, he was a clerk at the patent office in Bern, publishes five papers that challenge Newton, in which he says, time and space are one thing, <laughs> and they're relative, space-time, that energy and matter are the same thing. You can convert one to the other by an enormous factor. And uh, people listened to who this unknown kid was. And many of the great innovators were very young, barely out of the ranks of students. So Einstein was 26. That's the discovery of the DNA. Jim Watson was 25. Francis Crick was 31. Uh, Werner Heisenberg was 24 when he did quantum mechanics, 26 when he did his uncertainty principle. Paul Dirac predicted antimatter when he was 26, got the Nobel Prize in 31. That means if I'm teaching at a university, I have to listen to you and you and you because you may be the next Einstein. We have a big African initiative, the next Einstein initiative, which is very important to know. And finally, the most important thing for science is when we disagree, we have a method for arbitrating disputes. They are arbitrated with evidence and logic. That's essential. In science, authority rests in the rational empirical method, not an individual or a theory of belief. Methods of science is what counts, and that's why Einstein said, no amount of experimentation can ever prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. So these are the values of science, and what do you notice about these values? They are societal values that profoundly transform society for the better, for science can inspire and move the imagination. And so let me now move to say that our African Open Space Platform will be a key factor to make all this happen here. But <coughs> we are in Africa, so I'm going to say something a bit problematic. <laughs> There's rhetoric, declarations, plans, targets are not equal to action. That's true. And the great South African, my friend Zapiro, <laughs> did this cartoon. AU launch, and there's Arabic into French, English into Arabic, rhetoric into action. Ah, we're still missing it. Translator, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> so I'm convinced that our AOSP will be a great success, and working all together, despite the obstacles that we have, there's so much we can do for a whole generation and for the whole world. And if you think that this group of people is quite small but to do all of this, and that our competition is severe, we're going to surprise the world. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>